right, so first off, let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm Captain Jamie Hughes, as Steve said, I own Breakline Charters. I'm a fishing guide, I've been doing it since 2011. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? We good there? So primarily, we are fishing for flathead catfish on the Susquehanna in, in Pennsylvania, right? Has anybody ever been there or fished that river? Just curious. So, all right, yeah, I'm a little far from home. <laughs> But flatheads are not a native species where I live. They were introduced, they haven't been there very long. So our state record is holding right around 50 pounds. So we definitely don't have as big a fish as you guys. That doesn't mean I haven't caught some big fish. It just means where I live, we don't have them yet. They are getting bigger and the population is growing as time goes on, so that's a good thing. But it is a relatively young species for us. And throughout this seminar, I'll touch a little bit about, on a little bit about how, you know, the species differs from areas where it's native as to, you know, areas where it's been introduced. But again, I'm a fishing guide. Eight months out of the year, I'm on the water. We're either fishing for shark down in Chincoteague or flounder or uh, lar large mouth, small mouth, um, catfish, walleye, muskie, multi-species trips. I'm all over the place. I never stop. Uh, I don't personally catch a lot of fish during those eight months because I'm so busy watching everyone else catch fish. Uh, another thing that I'm pretty involved in is stuff with the community. You know, as far as getting kids into the sport, I run a lot of kids camps. Kids always fish for free on my charters, um, fundraisers. All the way up in Pennsylvania, we did a big pet supply drive whenever Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. Uh, parked my boat at a pet shop and people just came and donated supplies all day and then we put them on a skid wrapped them up and sent them down to Houston so you know it's not always fishing for me it's community bringing everybody together and education education is really important to me and then real quick I don't know if you guys know what that sport is but that's something I can do <laughs> that's called ice fishing that's whenever I make up for not being able to catch fish all the rest of the year that's whenever I get my fill so do a little bit of everything uh, so there, there you go. So I, a few of my sponsors have donated some cool stuff for me to give out to you guys. So if you pay attention, I'm going to ask some questions. Whoever gets some rights is going to get to take some stuff home with them. Fun, right? All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about physical identification of the flathead catfish, how it's going to differ from the other two common species, which are the blue and the channel. Scientific name, who's ever heard of the Pylodictus olivaris? That is what the flathead catfish is called. Sounds super fancy, right? But if you look at the breakdown, all that means is olive colored mudfish. That's a fancy way to say that, right? Pylodictus olivaris, that is your flathead catfish. You can tell that bottom picture there, can everybody see that okay? Kinda sorta, all right. So, you know, that's a very small, flathead but right next to a channel cat you know similar size so it's kind of cool you get to see the actual physical differences there and that little guy up there on the right that's Blake he caught that huge fish all by himself he was thrilled you can tell you know the shape of the tail of the flathead is going to be very different from the shape of the tail of the blue in the channel uh, anytime you see somebody with that Viking helmet on, on my boat, that means that was their first flathead. That's my greenhorn helmet. So if you go flathead fishing with me and it's your first flathead, regardless of size, you wear that helmet. It's, it's a thing. People love it. People request it, the helmet. <laughs> People have lied and told me it's their first flathead just to wear the helmet and then I find out it wasn't. <laughs> so here's a side by side. You've got your channel and your flathead. Very, very different fish. They're never mistaken for each other, all right? Usually the channel and the blue are the ones that sometimes cause the biggest social media debates, which blow my mind. But you know, what is this? What kind of fish is this? But you're never gonna hear the channel and the flathead be mistaken for each other just because they're so, so different. There you go. So these are my skulls. So if you look at the right picture there, there's about 41 individual bones that it takes to put together one of these skulls. It's not like you know deer, a deer skull or something like that. Lots of individual little pieces. But what these are is a really neat reference point. So I can actually show you side profiles of these different species of catfish. 
And you know, we're, we're, we're always so focused on the color of the fish, the shape of their fins, all that, that we don't really think about, you know, how, how are they actually made? You know, what's their design and how does that affect their feeding uh, capabilities? So this is a blue cat. So if we take a look at this blue cat side profile, you can see that the lower jaw and top jaw are pretty much lined up with each other. Pretty, pretty straight, right? And then we're gonna take a look at the channel cat. The channel cat's top sticks out a little further than the bottom. And if he had a top lip, they fall apart. I can't save them. But if that, if that was still there, it would stick out even further. All right, so the channel cat, by design, is most comfortable being a scavenger feeder. All right, it's just the way it's built. Now, can they hit things in the water column? Will they strike spinner baits? Yes, absolutely. But most commonly, they're built to be a scavenger feeder. Then we're going to take a look at the flathead. So when you see this flathead catfish, you can see there is a huge difference between its jaw placement compared to the channel cat. That lower jaw sticks way, way out there. All right. So the flathead catfish is absolutely a predator feeder. Not saying he won't scoop some, something off the bottom every now and then, but it's not easy. It's usually got to be up off the bottom because this guy, he likes to feed like this or like this. For him to feed like this would be pretty weird. All right, they're just not built for that stuff. So again, predator feeder. Um, you see a lot of people, you know, holding the, the flathead like this. That's because it's so easy to access that lower jaw. And I'll talk a little bit more about holding fish later too. But pretty cool. I don't know if you guys have ever seen anything like this. Usually this is a first for most people. Um, I actually get to see how they're built from the inside, not just the outside. And after I'm done, you guys are welcome to come up and touch these and hold them and stuff. I'm just not going to pass these around. <laughs> All right. A lot of work goes into these. So if you take a look over there, you'll see we have a channel, a blue, and a flathead. All right, so three very different fish. It's pretty easy to tell how the channel and the blue can get mistaked for each other, right? They're pretty similar looking. But if you take a look at the anal fin on the channel cat, it's going to be rounded. On the blue, it's going to be straight. That's one of the easiest telltale signs to tell the difference between the channel and the blue. And then your flathead, totally different color, totally different tail, very, very different fish. All right. I know that's a lot of words. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so basically, what I'm getting at here is it's pretty amazing how far this flathead catfish has been introduced. You would never think that there were flathead catfish in Oregon, but there are. Uh, more and more fisheries are introducing the flathead um, to help clean up fisheries and you know get rid of nuisance fish because they are an apex predator. There really isn't many enemies to the flathead other than the flathead itself. Has everyone sitting here already, who has not caught a flathead before? Cool, all right. Well, I hope you guys get to take something. I hope you all get to take something home from this, but I hope you guys go are able to catch your first one because of this. That would be so cool. <laughs> so talk a little bit about where the flathead's gonna hang out, where you're gonna go to look for this guy. So they're gonna live anywhere they're put, right? They're gonna live in rivers, lakes, ponds, reservoirs, pay lakes, whatever. Um, they do typically like slower current, but whenever we're talking about river fish, of course, rivers are going to fluctuate in their flow like crazy, right? You're going to have times when your river is running slow. You're going to have times when the river's up and running fast and muddy with tons of debris. So the fish have had to adapt to that, and they do. They just move around. So it becomes a matter of finding them when those conditions are changing on you like that. Uh, but a big thing to talk about are break lines. Again, my, my company name is Breakline Charters. I didn't call it that because we break fishing lines all the time. That would be a horrible marketing technique. <laughs> I called it that because a break line refers to a change in depth. All right, it's a fishing term. A break line can be visual from the surface with a water coloration change. So like if you're out, you're looking across the river and you see it's like kind of brownish and then it turns to like there's a harsh line where it kind of turns to a grayish tone or, or greenish to bluish. That's not just magic. There's something under the water that's making that happen. So that line of differentiation is actually referred to as a break line. Fish, all fish, not just flatheads, fish tend to like break lines. And that break line can be caused by a change in depth, a change in structure, a change in current, a change in vegetation. But that's what a break line refers to. So 
you know, how, how many people in here fish from a boat on a regular basis? It's a lot. And then there's somebody, some people here that bank fish, right? So, you know, it's a common misconception that with flathead fishing, you cannot be as effective from the bank as you can from a boat. For, the, for a little bit of that, yeah, that's true. But what you have to keep in mind is when you're bank fishing, you are essentially sitting on one of the best break lines there is in that river or on that lake, and that's the bank. Right at your feet, you've got a break line. Especially whenever the river's up, you know, whenever it's really, really flowing fast and there's a ton of debris coming down, we're not gonna be out there in our boats whenever there's, you know, stuff the size of cars floating by at a rapid pace. Well, the fish don't wanna be part of that mess either, right? So they're gonna hug the bank. They're gonna go over into that cover, that deep cover, the trees. The trees that were once, you know, out in the middle, you know, that are, that they're covered in water now. You know, everything changes whenever that river comes up and the fish are gonna hug those banks whenever that river's up, making for awesome bank fishing. Um, if you take a look at those pictures, you can see how close we are to the cover. I mean, we're almost able to touch the trees sometimes. That's how close to the structure and, you know, up top and below that, that we're fishing, deep, deep into that. Um, that's, where, that's where they're going to hang out. I mean, sometimes you'll catch them cruising around in open water, but a lot of times the flatheads are going to be in places you got to get into. And this, this picture, so this, this actually is kind of cool. You have to f follow along with what I'm about to say here. But that picture on the right and those pictures on the left are all in the same spot. So that, that tree right there is actually that tree out there. Okay? So just to give you an idea how much our river does fluctuate back home. You know, it, it spikes three to six feet in a couple days sometimes. So, you know, whenever that river comes up way high and that bank's completely underwater, that tree that used to be on the banks now 20 feet out in the water, those flatheads are gonna come back in there. They're gonna duck for cover. It makes for some great, great bank fishing. So mark my words, if you wanna go flathead fishing and you don't wanna take the boat out and the river's flooded, you've probably got as good or better shot at catching them from the bank when it's flooded like that as you did when you were in the boat. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so they are definitely predator feeders. Whenever they're smaller, they're gonna eat insects, they're gonna eat crayfish, they're gonna eat anything they can, you know, nibble up. But, you know, as they get bigger, they're gonna eat bigger bait. Sometimes, and I know you've probably all seen videos of, you know, flatheads with giant baits as almost as big as they are, basketballs, whatever, stuck in their mouths. I wouldn't put it past them to try to eat anything. Uh, but whenever they are smaller, they're going to primarily eat insects and crayfish. And as they grow, their bait grows. And they are, like I said, they are their only enemy out there. So they will eat each other. Um, that's why the mortality rate is, is, is so rough for these fish. Because as soon as they're hatched and swimming, other flatheads are trying to eat them. So it's a tough life. So... You know, there's just that top middle one. That's a little flathead that we caught. You can see our, you know, old cut bait is stuck down in there beside the crayfish. So that crayfish was his first meal. And then he decided to eat our bait too. And that was a smaller one. Um, I've never actually found it effective using cat, um, crayfish for bait for flatheads. I think it's just the smaller ones. I think it's more of a natural feeding habit. Um, as far as bait goes, you know, your shad, bluegills, Creek chubs. I'm sure you guys all have those fish down here too, or something like it. Uh, but all of those things are going to be, you know, real good bait for for flathead catfish. Uh, you can use them live. You can use them cut. Of course, nothing is going to be better than fresh live bait for flatheads. But if you don't have access to that, cut it up. Fresh cut bait works really well too. This is my friend. I've poked lots of holes in him over the years. But just to show you a few different ways uh, that you can actually bait, all right? So, you know, for your flat-bodied fish, like your shad, your bluegills, um, something that doesn't have a really wide back on it, one of your most effective ways is going to be through the back. It's going to keep it alive for a long time. It's a good way to hook your bait. Um, if you are using 
you don't have access to that and you have to use store-bought shiners or something, you can either go through the eyeball or you can go through the lips. All right? But whenever we get into using catfish for bait for catfish, okay, because small channel cats, bullheads, they make great flathead bait. They're so hardy. I mean, who remembers catching catfish as a kid? You throw it in a dry bucket, you drive an hour home, you take a, a shower, you go down to the kitchen and your catfish is still flopping around in a dry bucket waiting to be cut up, right? These things are so hardy. So they make fantastic bait. But the problem is your hook gap, right? Uh, catfish have really, really wide heads and really wide backs. So that's where it can be more effective to actually hook your catfish in the tail if you're using a catfish for bait for a flathead. Um, you can also take and cut off part of its tail to keep it from moving around so much on you and that's not going to kill it. So just a few different ways to you know, hook your bait. Attractants. So a lot of people whenever they're thinking about flatheads and blue cats they're not thinking about stinky stuff. It's more of a channel cat type you know, thing like, oh, I'm going to spray, you know, or dip or ch chunk or smear or whatever, you know, on my, my channel cat bait, but you don't think to do that for flatheads. I put kicking bass on every piece of bait that goes out of my boat, all right, whether it's alive, whether it's cut, whether it's fresh, whatever, okay, everything's going to get a little spritz of this stuff. It's made with all natural fish oils. They don't have a booth here. I wish they did. The stuff's great. Um, but, you know, they've got a scent for every kind of fish out there, you know, whether you're fishing saltwater, crappy, trout. And the neat thing about it is because it is all natural fish oils, just because it says trout on it doesn't mean it won't work for catfish because they're both cheese scents. They're just different cheeses, okay? So kicking bass attractants are something to definitely check out. I use a lot of the Anise Shad for the flatheads. Like, who'd have thought? but definitely like that stuff. <laughs> All right, here's whenever I'm going to start passing stuff around. There are hooks on these fishing rods. Hooks are sharp, everyone. Please be careful. <laughs> you can use spinning or casting rods. Not everybody likes or knows how to use a bait caster. I like bait casters for their line capacity, durability, that sort of thing. Um, but if you do want to or need to use a spinning reel, you just want to get something that's strong, has enough line capacity, and has uh, durable gears and a, and a nice adequate drag system. Because you don't want to have your fish of a lifetime come off because your reel explodes on you. So I'm going to send these around. I've got a medium, a medium heavy, and a heavy here. All right, The medium, the white one, uh, has a Garcia 6500 on it, all right, and that, I want you guys to actually take the tip and bend it. You're not going to break it. If you do, I'll get another one. Right. <laughs> but you're not going to break that rod. Even though it's a medium, that thing's tough. So the biggest fish we've personally caught on that one was about 44 and a half pounds. Remember that. 44 and a half pounds. All right. <laughs> um, so, you know, nice soft tip on there. Um, Whenever you guys have been out flathead fishing, one thing you've probably noticed is they can be very finicky feeders. You know, sometimes they'll just tip that bait, that rod, and you'll just see it doing this, but no commitment, no takedown. They're not always aggressive like, you know, the channels and the blues. So having a tip on the rod that is softer, more sensitive, they're not going to feel that so much as they're mouthing the bait and testing the water, so to speak. So I'm going to send this around. This is what we typically use for our flatheads when the river is at normal flowing conditions, uh, using anywhere from like two to six ounces of lead. You guys also feel free to inspect my rigs that are on there and everything, because I'm going to be talking about that too. What's that? You can do whatever you want. Just don't hook yourself. <laughs> All right, I'm also going to send around the medium heavy. This is typically the setup I'm using down on the James. Um, or if on my home waters, if the river's really up and moving and we're throwing more than six ounces of lead. If we're using anywhere from eight to 10, 12, this is usually my go-to. A little bit bigger reel size and a uh, little heavier line too. And then this is the heavy action. 
And this is no joke. So we caught a 300 pound shark on this. This is just a catfish rod, right? But it's the heavy action catfish rod. And uh, yeah, so there's a video on my YouTube channel of us actually reeling in a 300 pound shark. This rod has been in half um, and it, it, it did it like a champion. So this is actually what I use for my shark charters. Um, catfish rod, go figure. <laughs> So the flathead catfish, like I said, it tends to mouth the bait. It doesn't always commit right away. So there's a lot of things you can do to help um, not deter that, not have them get spooked, not have them spit that bait out and leave you hanging. Um, one thing you can do is, again, go with a rod that's got enough of a backbone but a soft enough tip that they're not going to feel that. You know, a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm going for 50, 60 pound fish, so I can use my buddy's tuna rod. Okay, yeah, you could, but there's much more effective ways to go about it. All right, so something that's got a softer tip, strong backbone, the backbone's gonna get you, you know, the ability to muscle in that, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 pound fish, but that sensitive tip is gonna be soft enough that they're not gonna spit that bait out, they're not gonna feel that resistance. I talked a little bit about reels. Um, you know, Penn tends to make some really nice heavy duty spinning reels if that's the direction that you want to go. Um, if you are going with bait casters, I, I tend to like Penn and Garcia. Just depends on my situation. I run a little bit of both. But whatever reel you go with, you want to make sure it's something that you can get parts for and that you can easily maintain. I know my equipment, my gear gets a lot more use than some people's because it is the business. However, anyone that fishes, you know, 20, 25, 35 times a year, their reels are going to get subjected to abuse. All right, so you want something that is a name brand only for the reason that you can then get parts for it. Most reels are going to come with a piece of paper that starts this big, that opens to about this big that's got you know a breakdown of all your internals all your parts part numbers all of that super handy to know how to actually maintain your own reels of course there are people that do that for a living that you can send your reels to and they'll mail them back to you all done but it's nice to be able to do that yourself and it's not that hard you know especially if everything you have is is the same you can just kind of knock it all out in a day or so but taking good care of that stuff is important So fishing line, mono or braid? I got into this yesterday with a few guys. Um, <laughs> mono people, let's see you. Braid people, let's see you. All right, I'm a mono people. And here's why. The areas that I fish are very, very rocky, okay? So braid is very, very strong. Everybody's like, oh, there's no stretch, there's no memory. Like, braid's the best thing ever braid is only as strong as all those twines are together all right so i just want you to think about a scenario we're gonna think about a kind of a jaggy rock down in the down in the water all right we're gonna take a piece of mono and we're gonna take that mono and we're gonna rub it across that sharp rock under the water that mono is going to for the most part slide over that rock it's going to glide over it the mono depending on the brand and everything is is going to almost self-heal as it goes over mono is pretty tough when it comes to rocky conditions now we're going to take that and we're going to we're going to take that same rock but we're going to take a piece of braid and we're going to take that braid and we're going to rub it across that rock so the chances of one or two or maybe more of those strands of braid beginning to fray are pretty strong. So now your 100 pound braid, it doesn't just go down to 99 pound braid. You lose one or two of those strands and all of a sudden your braid is very, very weak to the point where sometimes you bring your line in and you're messing with it in the boat and it breaks and you're like, how could that possibly break? That was 100 pound you know, test. Well, it's because one or two of your strands got weakened. So that's why I use mono. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, checking that out pretty good. Huh? Okay, so uh, not catfish related, but if anybody is interested in the shark rig that I have on there, um, Bloodline Tackle 
Um, not the catfish bloodline, but there's a, another guy, Bloodline Tackle. He makes those for me. He does a tremendous job. His name's Aaron, but I custom order all my shark rigs through that guy. He's, he's great. Don't use this for catfish at all. No, that's just shark. Yeah. I guess you could. <laughs> Very toothy catfish. Really, really mad toothy catfish. <laughs> But anyhow, so that's kind of the braid mono thing. Now I do use braid in some applications in top water, you know, bass fishing, I'll use some braid. Um, we'll use braid when we're fishing for, you know, sea trout, um, you, know, fit, you know, in the bay we'll use braid sometimes. I use braid surf fishing, but for cat fishing, I am definitely a mono person. Um, so, you know, as far as your pound test goes, of course it's going to depend on the size fish you're targeting, but just because a line says it goes to 30 pounds, that doesn't mean you're limited to catching a 30 pound fish on it. I think everybody here probably already knows that. You can catch a much bigger fish on 20 pound test than a 20 pound fish. So, you know, be realistic. 30 to 50 pounds is usually a pretty good range if you're doing monofilament. Um, if you're doing braid, if you insist, then always double it. It's a good rule of thumb to double your braid as to whatever mono you'd use. It's going to give you about the same, ultimately the same diameter. You know, when it comes to your fishing line, uh, having good visibility is important. So if you take a look at that, we've got eight out the back and I'm running two out the sides with planer boards. You know, and I, and I know it's bright in here and you can't see, but in real life, you can see every single one of those lines and where it comes off the rod and where it hits the water. So visibility is important for that reason. And also think about if that, that tower, that, that far left rod in the, in the tower in the back got a big flathead on it and it just decided it was gonna swim over and under and around everything else back there, it makes for a mess real quick. So whenever you can actually see your line and see what you're doing and untangling, it makes life so much easier. So that's why a lot of these catfishing lines are gonna be the high vis that they are. And you know, whether it's bright, sun up, sun down, you know, or total darkness, you know, and you're using the UV, uh, the slime line is super bright, really like it. Anybody in here use slime line? Cool, all right, all right. Terminal tackle, all right, circle hooks have been around forever. Everybody knows what a circle hook is. Who knows what a kale hook is? Cool, all right, so big differences, right? The kale has that nice wide hook gap. It's awesome. You're not really limited with the size bait you can put on there like you are with a circle. But on a kale hook, you kind of have to set the hook. You have to get your hands into that and you have to have your timing right. The beauty of a circle hook is you don't do anything. You could be asleep and hear your rod going and hey, I got a fish on. It's the lazy man's way to fish. But you are limited by that hook gap on the circle hook. So my favorite hook is the one in the middle. That's called the mad catter. That is the cross between the kale and the circle. It is in my mind, the best hook that's ever been created. Um, you can set it or you can forget it. You can use that hook however you want. We have had such a great increase um, in, you know, with uh, hookups on the boat because not all my clients are fishermen. I get a lot of people that their biggest fish is a, you know, 13 inch trout they caught in a pond one day. You know, they're, they're, they're looking at the bait we're using going, oh my goodness, that's bigger than anything I've ever caught before. <laughs> so these people are not skilled anglers. So they don't always get the timing right with the kale hook. And a lot of times they're too quick to the trigger with the circle. Yep. You can generally just reel down. Back. Absolutely. You do, not you do not. You can if you want to, you do not have to set the hook. I mean, I. I'm telling you, it's, it's awesome. I was always a Gamagatsu 7 aught 8 aught circle girl. Like that was my hook. Anybody had ever talked to me, that's all I used. I was die hard with it. And then I just, I, whenever we were using wider bodied bait fish like creek chubs and things like that, I always used a kale hook, but our, our hookup rate sucked because people just couldn't get the timing right. You know, and then I saw these hybrid circle kales and I'm like, hmm, wonder what that's all about. Total game changer. Total game changer. Yeah. What are they called again? Mad catters. Mad catters. Yep. 
Yep, he does. Yes. It depends what size fish you're going to be targeting and how much current you're dealing with. Each one of those has a great purpose. So if you're fishing the river and you're using, you know, two to six ounces on a regular basis and no more, the medium's a great rod. You know, if your fish are going to be, you know, five to 40 pounds, it's a great rod. If you're using more lead or bigger fish, I'd go to the medium heavy. If you need to pull your buddy's truck out of the lake or something, you know, you use the, the heavy. I'm gonna send this around. This is an example of hook sizes. Um, there's a float in there, some beads, some swivels, just to give you an idea so you can actually hold it in your hands exactly the size stuff you're gonna use for targeting flatheads. Um, especially for those that are new to it, a lot of this stuff you're seeing here, you'd think you were at a saltwater convention because of how big and crazy some of this stuff is. Uh, so this will give you a chance to kind of hold it in your hands and check it out. Does everybody know those three knots? Very common knots, all right? The snell knot can be made so complicated. I've seen people snell in ways so I'm like, what, what are you doing? Why are you making that so hard? So I'm going to show you guys real quick the quickest, easiest way to snell a hook. You're going to go in through the eye of the hook. You're going to hold your line against the hook shaft nice and tight. We're going to do eight quick loops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we're going to go back up through the top. We're going to pull that tight. And you've got a snell. It's not going to let go. All right, so that is a no knot, real quick, easy snell. Hang out afterwards. I'll show you how to do it <laughs> closer up. The improved clinch, that's going to be a really good one for securing your swivels. For that one, you're going to go through the hook. You're going to give it six, seven twists. The loop that you've created above the eye, you're going to take your tag end, you're going to go through there, back through the loop that you just made by doing that, and then pull everything down. And that's your improved clinch. Now that's going to be really good for your terminal tackle, like your, your swivels, uh, barrel swivels, snap swivels, that sort of thing. And the last one, some people would say it is the strongest knot known to mankind. Uh, it is the Palomar. For the Palomar knot, you're going to take your, your line, you're going to kind of fold it in half. All right, and then we're going to take that and we're going to go through the eye of the hook. Now we've got this. Then we're going to tie this in a loose knot. Now we've got this. We're going to take this and we're going to go around the hook and we're going to snug everything up. And that's a Palomar knot, and that is super strong. So, there you go. Yes? You see it on online all the time. Like, which one's stronger? The snell or the ball? In your opinion. Yeah, they are. Yeah. That's a stronger one. Sorry. Yeah. What's that? That's a stronger one. Why would you use the other? Because it's going to really, like, like he just said, he said it perfectly. So one is going to be better for hooks that are, that have a straight eye on them. The other one's going to be better for if it's angled because that one, you see that one comes off the top and the snell is going to kind of come from inside. So it's going to change the trigger action of the hook. So it depends what kind of hook you're using uh, would determine which knot I'm going to use. Um, Tackle Bandit over there has a ton of lead. I don't know if you guys saw that, but as far as lead goes, um, if you if you took a look at my rigs, you'd see I've got the the easy slide, you know, the sinker slide on there. That is again, that's going to help that that flathead be able to take and play with that bait for a little while and not feel the resistance of the lead or the tip of the rod if you're using something with a sensitive enough tip. So 
With your lead, use just enough to keep your bait in place. Don't overdo it. Don't be one of those people that always uses 10 ounces of lead no matter where they're fishing. It's not necessary. And even though you are using a softer tipped rod and you are using an easy slide, they could still potentially feel that resistance. So I'm a fan of using just enough lead to keep your bait in place. I'm gonna vary, most of the time I'm using two ounces, but if the river goes up a little bit, I'll bump it up to three, four, six, whatever I need to do to keep my bait in place. But I'm not always putting 10 ounces of lead on the end of my rod. Make sense? There's all kinds of lead. There's pencil sinkers, there's coin sinkers, bank sinkers, pyramid sinkers. There's all these different kinds. I like coins. Um, I have found that the coin sinkers tend to get hung up a lot less in the rocky areas that I fish. But we're doing all stationary fishing. We're dropping an anchor, we're putting all these rods out. We're not bumping, we're not drifting, we're not doing any of that. So depending on your technique, that would determine which type of lead you'd pick. Um, so are you talking about the ones that have the hole that go directly through the middle? So that kind would go on the main line. Right. Yeah. Oh, to like an egg sinker or an inline sinker like what you're saying. Yeah, I, I like to have my sinker on the main line, yes, but I like to put it on an easy slide or a sinker slide. Um, I did use egg sinkers for a while because when I was working with a friend of mine, a captain down on Santee, we used egg sinkers. And I was like, well, they work great there, so they must work great at home. And I, I went back to coin sinkers. They were much better for where I'm at. So catfishing is not what it used to be whenever I used to go with my dad, you know, 30 years ago when we'd sit on the bank and use a fishing rod we got Kmart, you know, and worms. It's definitely a totally different sport now and it's, it's gotten crazy. So, you know, you can, you can make it as simple or as crazy as you want, but there is nothing wrong with dressing up your presentation. And you can do that with all sorts of things that are out now. You've got rattles, floats, and really what's a Zara spook, not, not much different, all right, which is an inline rattle float. Um, all of those things are going to make sounds. They're gonna be bright colors. Some of them glow in the dark. Someday somebody will probably make something with sirens or I don't know, but you know, all of those things, it's just getting crazier as time goes on, how much we're dressing up these flathead presentations. So the float and the float rattle, you notice on my, both of my catfish rods, they both had the floats on there. That goes back to talking about the skulls and the uh, jaw position. Thank you. We can just actually sit them right here. Okay. Thank you so much. Aha. <laughs> uh, you wanna get that bait up into the water column because that's where they're feeding. You don't want your bait laying on the bottom. Get it up off the bottom. Use a float, use a rattle float. Use something to get it up there where they're eating. As far as leader length goes, you know, if you use something that, like, okay, so the float rattles, the ones in the bottom left-hand corner, once they're tied on, they're tied on. They're not going anywhere. You can't adjust their height lower or higher on your leader line. But the float on the far right, the peg float or cigar float, whatever you want to call it, they can be moved up and down on your leader line. So you can move it you know, higher, lower. I typically make my leaders, you know, anywhere from two to three feet. Yes? Take, uh, on that in line, if you take a piece of surgical tubing and wrap it around there, and put your line through the, the guides that are already there, you can slide it up. You could do that, absolutely. You're right, yeah. Yep. Yep. But um, all those things are going to help get your bait up off the bottom, up more into that strike column, and you can adjust where you're putting that bait to. So don't be afraid to try some of this stuff. It definitely does work. It's not gimmicky. I'm sorry? It depends on the conditions. If the river's really ripping, and it's super fast. I think you can actually have too much going on on your rig. Um, so whenever it's really going super fast, I'm not going to put all that stuff on there. I'm going to typically just use a standard uh, foam float. 
Now, there's times when it's really slow, hardly moving at all, almost stagnant, where I'll put a rattle float on there. I'll put a, you know, one of the rotating rattle beads at the bottom. I'm dressing these things up like crazy. I've even done some experimental stuff with spinner, spinner bait blades and things like that, just to you know, play around with different ideas out there. Because uh, there are times when the more you can make noise and bring them in, the better. Um, as far as organizing goes, you know, rig wrap cases. I don't know if that's something you've ever seen or used here at the show. Um, I've got a bunch in here. I'll actually sit at home and pre-tie everything I need for all my flounder trips, my you know, flathead channel blue. I have a rig wrap case loaded up, ready to go uh, with all that stuff. The one on the left there in the picture, that's actually my flounder case. And I don't know if you guys have ever done any saltwater fishing, but it's no secret that your rigs are almost a one-time use. Like if you go to the beach once a year, by next year your hook's gonna look like heck and it's gonna be all corroded and nasty. You might as well just throw it away. But the neat thing about rig wrap cases is after you put your rig in there and you're done for the day, they're actually perforated. They've got holes all over these cases. So I can just take them and hold them right under the faucet and run fresh water through them and then they air dry and the hooks are good to go next time I go. So. They're pretty neat little, neat little things. And because Steve Douglas asked me to be here, and because I do in fact use them, I thought it might be good to have a little monster rod holders plug, right? <laughs> you know, some of those have actually come off of two boats ago. I've, I've had some of those rod holders on three boats now, and you can't tell. They really are awesome. Um, I, I use them for uh, drying my sneakers sometimes. I, <laughs> I, uh, we'll use them like if I'm putting the crappie rods, you know, I'll lay them across the side of them. You know, they're, I don't know. Monster rod holders really are awesome. Steve does a good job. Here comes Mr. Rig Wrap himself. Cool. Hey, thank you. It's like everybody's getting a rig wrap. It's pretty cool. So, I, I touched real briefly on handling fish, you know, how you're grabbing the jaw, all right? So not everybody's comfortable doing that. Understandably so. It can be a little intimidating to put your hands in giant fish's mouth like that, right? So if you're nervous and you're putting your hands in there and you've got this big fish, if you get a little scared, you're going to panic. You're going to pull your hands out. The fish is going to fall down and get hurt. We really don't want that to happen, okay? So when you're handling fish, there are all kinds of devices to make it safer for you and the fish for holding them. But this is really important. Fish are not built like us. They're not built to stand vertically on dry land. They are built to be horizontal in water. The water that is surrounding their body is what is keeping their organs in place. Think about that, okay? Them being like this, and that water pressure is what's keeping all of their stuff where it's supposed to be. So when we take them out of the water and we're holding them up like this, and you're like, whoa, look at that big flathead, look at that big belly. That's not its belly, that's its everything. And it's all just pooling, all right? It is not good for the fish to hold them like that. It looks cool for a picture. If you must do it, do it quick and get that fish back in the water or at least hold it horizontally. The best thing you can do is support that fish's body and hold it securely so it's not gonna get hurt and then place it back in the water, let the water flow through the gills and give it a nice easy release. Um, the worst thing you can do is hold them by the gills. All right, don't do that. They might swim away, but they probably aren't gonna make it real far. So take good care of your fish. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying you can't keep one and eat it every now and then. I'm not one of those people. I don't want to start a debate. But if you're going to be a catch and release fisherman, do it right. Give the fish its best shot. All right. So remember what I said about their bodies and, and all their organs being held in place by that water. It's not something we think about very much. We just pull a fish out of the water and we're like, yeah, look what I got. And everything inside is just sagging and pulling on them. All right. I take out all kinds of people, right? Young, young at heart. Um, I had my boat built uh, to be able to accommodate everyone, regardless of their ability. I've taken out numerous uh, children and people in wheelchairs. Anyone, anyone can catfish. I don't care how strong you are, how young you are, how old you are, anyone can catfish. And you can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. 
but anybody can do it. It's a really fun sport. Um, who's ready to answer some questions? All right. What is the biggest fish we caught on that medium rod? Bingo. All right. See me at the end. All right. This should be really easy. What are the little cases called that regrets? All right. Hmm. What does this skull go to? What kind of fish? Wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Who said blue? All right. All right. So I'm going to have all you guys come and see me at the end then, all right? Um, I do have a book I wrote a few years ago, Tips and Techniques for Monster Catfish. It's going to be a little bit more detailed, uh, get a little bit more into stuff than I did up here. I'm going to talk a little bit about barometric pressure, spawn habits, that sort of thing. I do have those available if you want to grab one uh, before you head out. I'll be you know, up here for a few minutes after this and then at the Catch the Fever booth, uh, booth for a while. But I wanted to thank you guys for coming to listen to me for a while. Yes? Who built my boat? So the shell of my boat was built by Sea Ark. All right, um, just because I needed 24 feet and I needed a convertible floor plan so that I could deal with uh, assistant de uh, devices in the boat. So we bought a 2472 Sea Ark and then we completely gutted it. So everything on my boat, see if I can. Whoosh. So that's a handicap grab rail on the front there. The front deck was built onto the boat. The console was built up against the front deck. And then the side bench seats and the center bench seat all are removable so that I can get you know anybody in there that I need to. It is a jet boat too. That thing, even though it's 24 feet long, it can run in like eight inches of water. That's a perfect boat. I've seen all your videos. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. And my boat's called the Mad Catter, which is the same name as the hooks that I use. So you remember that too. But that's it. If anybody wants to see me afterwards, be happy to talk to you in person. I do have a Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. What's that? Five bucks. Thank you, guys.